Good afternoon. Today we are going to do, to do the last lesson in our quadratic unit and we are going to continue using the calculator in the way that we learned in the previous lesson, lesson doing regressions in order to model real world data. Before we jump directly into that, I wanted to just talk for a moment and remind you what quadratic tables look like. So here I have a quadratic equation y equals negative x squared plus 6x minus 8. And that equation has been mod or has been, it creates, generates this particular table. I'm going to remember that domain for a quadratic equation is negative infinity to infinity. And the range for this particular one is negative infinity to 1. And we'll talk about why that is. I want to remind you that from your table, you should be able to find the y-intercept if that information is given by identifying what the y value is when x equals zero. So this, I'm going to put an arrow, is my y-intercept. Again, it's the y value when x equals zero. I can also, in using a similar strategy, identify my, oh, over here, I was going to write my y-intercept, zero, negative eight. I can also identify my x-intercepts. Remembering that the x-intercept is the value of x when y equals 0. So this is an x-intercept to 0. And I notice there's another one down here for 0. Those are my x-intercepts. Mm -hmm. There we go. And then lastly, sometimes, and, and, and folks, you won't necessarily always have a table that is so nicely laid out with identifiable x-intercepts, y-intercepts, or as I'm going to speak up next, our vertex. I notice in this particular case that my numbers are, and I'm actually going to, I'm going to do this real quick. I'm going to do our first differences and ask and identify that the difference between negative 8 and negative 3 is an increase of 5. So when the x value increases by 1, my y value increases by 5. To go from 1 to 2 in the x values, my y values increase by 3. So immediately I notice that this is not a linear equation because a linear equation will have a constant increase as x increases. From 2 to 3, an increase of 1, my y values increase by 1. And then an interesting thing happens here. Now my y values actually start decreasing. This one went down by 3, and this one went down by 5. And I noticed that there is a little bit of a pattern here. That pattern is very identifiable if we do what's called a second difference, which is to see what the differences would be a second time. From 5 to 3 is a difference of negative 2. And notice, ha, huh, look at this. It's the same each time. So a quadratic table will always exhibit second the same second differences. And that's how we can identify that it is a quadratic table. So when the x values increase by 1, the second difference in a quadratic table will be constant. All right, the reason I brought that up was because I noticed right here, when my values went from going up by a little bit each time to going down by a little bit each time, that is a way to identify the vertex. And I'm going to put that down here. This is my vertex. And if you will remember, the vertex at 3, 1 I, helps us identify the axis of symmetry. So my axis of symmetry will be at 3. And my range value comes uh, from my y value, which is where my graph changes directions. And so the highest point on this graph will be 1. How do I know it's the highest graph? Again, remember, if you look at the leading coefficient of our first term, since a is greater than, or sorry, since a is equal to negative one and a is less than zero, this parabola opens down, which means my vertex is a maximum, which also tells me that one is gonna be the highest point on this graph. So that's just a review of how we can uh, identify characteristics of the quadratic of the table and the information that we can gain and how we can verify that a table 
is quadratic using second differences. Once we know that a table is quadratic, we can use the regressions we talked about last class to create the, uh, an equation that models this data. So the first thing I'm going to do before I start doing my regression is I'm just going to double check to make sure that this is a quadratic table to, from 9 to 0 is a, is a difference of 9 when my x values went up by 1. This is a difference of 5. My x values went up by 1. Again, x goes up by 1. My y value goes down by 1. Here's where I'm changing directions a little bit to go from negative six to negative three is actually the increase of three when my x's went up by one, x's go up by one, my y values go up by seven. So it's definitely not linear. These are not constant. I can check second differences, however. To go from negative nine to negative five is an addition of four, and it is here as well, and again, and so what I notice is my second differences is four, and that makes it quadratic. So just a, a side note, your second difference have to be two in order for it to indicate a quadratic. It just has to be constant. Once I know that this is definitely a quadratic table, I can follow the instructions we taught in the last lesson, and I can put these x, val x and y values into my calculator. I'm going to run through that very quickly here. And I, okay, so I'm going to put my x, well, now I can't see it. Okay, I'm going to populate my list. And I'm going to do this pretty quickly if I can without making mistakes. And I'm just entering my X and Y values. I'm going to make sure I use a negative sign, not a subtraction sign. The calculator doesn't like that. Well, once I have my data entered, I'm going to do stat over to calc, five for quadratic. And again, this window might look a little different in your calculator depending on the version you have. But I notice that I have an A value of two, a B value of negative three, and a C value of five. I've shown that here. I can write my equation now. It's 2x squared minus 3x minus 5. All right, so now we have a quadratic equation, and we didn't have to do too horrible much work to get it. Why is this useful? Let's find out. All right, oftentimes in math, we use very contrived examples that come out with friendly, uh, friendly numbers that are easy to manipulate. But the real use of some of the mathematics we're learning comes when we apply it to real world data. And that's what we're gonna do for, for the remainder of this lesson. The first thing I'm gonna look at is a table that shows me the number of smoking related deaths due to lung cancer since the year 2000. Folks, I in no way guarantee that this is actually correct information, but we're gonna use it. We need to come up with a quadratic equation that would model this data. So I urge you to pause the video, use the steps one through four on the previous page, and see if you can come up with a quadratic equation to model this data. You'll notice when you do this that you are going to get less friendly numbers because the data is a little bit more realistic. Go ahead and write your quadratic formula using at least two decimal places. Pause the video, try it, and then rejoin us. All right, hopefully when you did your regression, you ended up with a model that looks like a negative 0 0.23. And I'm gonna use T for time. You could also use X, it doesn't really matter, minus a 0 0.76 T plus 92.1. This is an approximation, folks. It's not an exact model, but it definitely will mimic this quadratic equation as best as we can. We are now gonna just talk about the function domain and range versus a tabular domain and range. We know that given a function, such as d of t, 
that the domain is going to be negative infinity to infinity and that my range value is in this case going to be um, represented by my x-intercept. And so I'm going to use, sorry, this is my y-intercept. Sheesh. Um, I'm going to use 92.1 and just go with the fact that it's going to go from negative infinity to 92. Point one approximately I'm using this value because this is my function not my table I am using I'm going from negative 2 up to 92.1 and actually I'm going to square this because I would touch it and I'm making it I, I'm noticing that 92.1 is my vertex range value or the vertex y value and that this is a maximum because my a value is negative so I know it's downward opening when we talk about domain and range of a table, I can't use these infinite symbols because I really only know specific x values and specific y values. I don't know, necessarily know that points in between 0 and 1 are part of the data set. The function is continuous. A data set is discrete. So to my domain values are simply the few points I was given so I would list them all out between brackets. If you want to be efficient, you can skip a few numbers once a pattern has been established and then end with the last value. For my range values, I don't have a consistent pattern. So I literally have to list out every single one. And I know that whether you own it or not, you're groaning internally. You might be groaning externally, because this is kind of a pain. 80 said, did I lose my place when I talk? So you just list them all out. And mercifully, we don't ask you to do this very often. 72.5. If I look at my data, I start at 91 for my y values. My x values are all increasing one. I go down a little, down, 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 continue to go down. And I continue to go down and down and down. So I don't really notice where my vertex is. I don't see that place where the graph changes directions. So using a regression is going to be our best bet. Once I have identified the domain and the range, then I can graph the function. The red line represents the function, d of t. It's continuous which means every point along that red line is part of this function. The x's represent the actual x and y values that I was given. They are not continuous, they're just little x's, and I made them x's so they would show up a little bit better. And notice most of them are pretty close to being on the line, but some of them don't lie exactly on the line. But the line does, a, the red line, my function, does a really good job of encapsulating the spirit of my data points, and um, I think models it pretty well. But that's just a guess, um, and we'll talk about determining the accuracy of that in a moment. Let's first use our function model to predict the number of deaths that would occur in the year 2015. The reason I go to the trouble of coming up with a function model is because you'll notice that this is in the years since 2000. So my table goes all the way up to 2008. My table does not go all the way up to 2015. So I, can, I, I don't have the data readily available, available to determine this, but I do have a model that I can use. So in this case, I'm going to let t equal 15, and I'm going to substitute that into my equation. And my equation was deaths in the year um, and 15, 2015 years since 2000 should be equal to negative 0.23. And I'm going to leave space for my 15. But to be expedient, I'm not going to switch pins a thousand times in quick succession. But instead of using a t variable, I'm going to use the number 15. And once I've done that, 
I can substitute this or I can type this directly into my calculator. My calculator will spit out that the number of deaths since the year 2015 is 28.95 and I that seems kind of low to me but then I noticed that in my graph this is per thousand hundred thousand people. So my the answer to this particular question is I predict that there will be about 29,000 or 29 deaths in the year 2015. So that's how I can use a quadratic regression to model data sets and use it to make predictions. Pretty cool. I can do the same thing for this. I urge you to um, go ahead and pause the video and see what your model will come up with as a prediction of the number of deaths since 2015 or since 2005. I know that this data point is in your table, but this will allow us to verify or to determine how closely our model, our function model, mimics our data table. So go ahead and figure this out by substituting 5 in for t, then rejoin us. All right, when you substituted t with the number five for the year 2005, I'm hoping that you came up with uh, about 200 or 20, uh, 82.55 deaths. I can't really have, a, this is per 100,000 people. You are welcome to round this to about 82 or 83 deaths per 1,000 people. But I'll notice that in my data table, I was given decimals. I was given uh, answers or number of deaths to the nearest tenth. So I think being a little bit more accurate than a whole number can help us here. The reason I went to the trouble of mimicking or calculating the number of deaths that I was already given is so that I can compare my table with my function. So in my table, I was told that in the year 2005, geez, I've got 2015 in my head, there should be 82.6 deaths. My function gave me an answer that in 2005, I would have 82.55 deaths. So the difference between these is very small. The numbers are very close together. The number of deaths is less than one person per 100,000 as predicted versus actual. And so this means that my model is a good model. If you saw a very, uh, uh, a big difference here between the predicted and the actual, then that would tell you that perhaps you use the wrong kind of function model, or perhaps the data is unreliable, or maybe it just can't be modeled very easily. The other time you would see that if these little X's did not closely um, surround my function line, then that might be another visual indication. But on the whole, this is a excellent technique for making predictions about things that happen in our real world, even when we don't know an actual equation, but we just have some good statistical data points. Hope you enjoyed this. This is actually something you could use in the real world. And I will see you next time.